let me first uh, say a few words before we start with the um, formal talk of Jean-Pierre. So I want to you know, first welcome everybody. Thanks for like um, logging in and attending the SIAM FME seminar series, online seminar series. Just want to recall that uh, each talk will be 45 minutes and uh, there will be two opportunities to ask questions, uh, one during the middle of the talk and one at the end of the talk. And uh, any question you should post it in the chat area. And then we will give you the possibility to either ask the question uh, directly or if you would like me to read the question to jump here, uh, I will do that. And um, yeah, after the regular talk, which will last for an hour, including questions, there will be an informal uh, after talk gathering. And this is basically will be an opportunity for, um, for everybody to step in and chat, uh, I mean, with jump here, but also with the other participants, ask uh, questions related to the talk or even unrelated to the talk make comments, uh, share our insights. So it's really an informal uh, discussion as uh, we would have at the regular seminar. Uh, also, I want to announce that there will be no talk on July 9. And the reason is that there is the SIAM annual meeting. In fact, uh, the activity group in financial mathematics and engineering has organized uh, uh, many mini symposium and there will be some information uh, forthcoming so that uh, yeah, you will have the opportunity to attend these seminars online. Sorry, this mini symposium line. And um, I want to announce also that the next talk will be on July the 23, 23rd. And uh, this will be a new feature of this online seminar series. In fact, there will be early career talks. And uh, the idea is to have given opportunity to early career researchers to show what they are doing uh, and uh, get visibility in front of the higher of the broader community. I mean, get feedback from all of you. Uh, we can provide like feedback, uh, comments, questions, uh, ideas for future research, and so on. Uh, so this will be on July 23. And now, after uh, making all these announcements, I would like to start with uh, talk. And today we have the pleasure of having uh, Jean Pierre uh, as the speaker. So Professor Jean Pierre Fook. I think everybody knows him in the community, so it shouldn't need any introduction. But just to follow the regular format, I will introduce him nonetheless. So Jean-Pierre has held position at the CNRS and at the Ecole Polytechnique in France. He then joined the North Carolina State University in 1998, uh, and he was uh, the one that started the master in financial mathematics. In fact, he was one of the first thing, first people, to, person to start this uh, master that we see in many, many institutions nowadays. And in 2006, uh, Jean-Pierre joined the Department of Statistics and Applied Probability at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and is now a distinguished professor there, and also the co-director of the Center for Financial Mathematics and Actuarial Research. And uh, I mean, his research uh, is uh, like spans several different areas. So he like, looked at random media uh, with applications ranging from wave propagation phenomena, which was uh, like uh, early on in his career and now is like very active in the area of financial mathematics where he has made a number of very important contributions. He published a lot of articles. He advised uh, successfully many students. He has co or three books and also is a co-editor of the handbook on systemic risk uh, with the um, like Cambridge University Press in 2013. And uh, everybody knows that Jean Pierre is the editor in chief of the Journal of Our Society of Financial Mathematics and Engineering, the SIAM Journal of Financial Mathematics. And he's also a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics since 2009, and uh, is a SIAM fellow since 2011. So I could go on and say more and more, but I will stop here so that Jean Pierre has an opportunity to start discussing uh, uh, the content of his latest research. Jean Pierre, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good? Yeah. Okay, good. So thank you so much for this uh, nice uh, introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very nice to organize these seminars and I uh, thank you all the organizers. Um, so this was my sabbatical and of course now the sabbatical is like three months and a half in the house. It's a weird sabbatical, but usually in sabbatical, you, you look at new problems and that's what I did in some way, but also you take a look back to all problems and things that you didn't know to do and you spend some time to try to maybe understand and prove them. And this is, that talk is about that. 
is looking backward and uh, looking at uh, things that we didn't uh, really address correctly mathematically, I mean. And now uh, I guess uh, we have a way to do it and I want to explain that uh, because I think that the techniques that I will present can be used in many other situation, comparable situation, and I hope this will be helpful for everybody. So this is the joint work with uh, Maxime Bichuch, Raymond Hu, uh, Ronnie Sierka, and Talia Zarifopoulou, and uh, I will go on with the talk. So it's about portfolio optimization, and uh, I will try to make things simple, simple, but it's still a little bit technical, but let, let's keep it simple. So I have only one stock. Uh, I will have uh, the possibility of adding two factors, driving returns and volatility. Why two, you will see this is important, is either one or more than, more than one, and two is a good thing. And uh, I will explain why we make that choice a little bit late, later on. So this is the equation for the stock. Uh, it's continuous, everything's continuous. There is no jump in this uh, talk. R equals zero to make things simple. Pi T is the amount of wealth invested in the risky asset. That's your control, your strategy. And X pi is a wealth uh, associated to this self-financing strategy. And of course, it's well known that uh, easy to derive that uh, the wealth process is satisfying this uh, SDE. Now the goal is to maximize the utility. So you have a terminal time, capital T, a utility U, and you want to maximize the expected utility choosing your, your pi. So that's your goal. And this is what we want to analyze. So let me tell you a little bit more on the admissibility uh, set of controls. And I will add a little bit more later on. Pi, of course, should be adapted. It has to be adapted to the brain motion driving the, the stock and the, and the factors. It has some integrability condition. This is the least you can do for the SDE to, to have a solution. But I will add a little bit more later on. And we want the process to stay positive because we are in the positive axis. So that's uh, part of the admissibility condition. And then we have a set of condition on you. So this can be technical, but let me, uh, let me tell you this very classical um, uh, utility function strictly increasing, strictly concave on, on, on the positive axis. Uh, U is smooth enough as, as much as we need, and I will not get too much into the details, but we need some regularity, maybe like seven, C7. Uh, U behave like powers at zero and infinity. So that gives you an idea. And to, to make things even uh, more practical, you can think of U as a mixture of uh, of power utilities with different uh, risk aversion, maybe two, maybe a continuum. It can be a mixture, but you have a maximum and a, and a minimum. And let me give you a picture here. So these are the mixture of two uh, power utilities when the gamma, the risk, uh, the, the, uh, the risk aversion is, uh, takes these two values. So one, one is right there, the, the other utility is here. In this picture, we don't see much. It's a mixture of the two. What is more interesting is the risk aversion. If you take a power utility, the risk aversion is constant. So you have two constant, and now you join these two constant by this nice curve. And that gives you the freedom of having a risk aversion, which depends on the wealth, which is very desirable in many, many cases. So that's, that's basically what we, we need to keep in mind for the, for the utility. So now the problem is difficult. I mean, it's a difficult problem even in the Markovian setting. So let me explain what, what I mean by that. So if the, if the wealth is, is following this uh, SDE, then you have your two processes. Later on, we will differentiate them by scales. We will differentiate them in many ways, but we assume that you have the two factors. And then again, I, I recall that we want to maximize the expected utility at terminal time. And we have this value function, and this is our object of interest. We, we, we want the value function and the best strategy. Of, of course, the optimal strategy is also the of interest. Now, the problem is that we don't know much about V, and in particular, this, in particular, the, the regularity. But if V was sufficiently irregular, like having a second derivative and all the derivatives that you see here, then you can write an AGB equation. So V will satisfy this AGB equation where you recognize the infinitesimal generator of the Y, infinitesimal generator of the Z, you recognize the uh, mixed, uh, the, the correlation between the two factors, and then the rest of the usual, uh, usual uh, 
part of the SGB equation with a terminal condition. Okay, so, well, an approach to that would be, okay, let's use viscosity solution for this equation. I'm not going in that direction. Actually, I, want to, I will not assume much about, about V. And simply that is definition. That will be the definition which is important. And I will not work with this AGB equation. So what we know uh, without, uh, without going into the, uh, directly on the definition of V, that V is strictly concave. So this, if, if the second derivative exists, it's negative, and then you can maximize in the, in the, pro, the quadratic in pi, and you get your, your fully nonlinear AGB equation written in this form, and lambda is a sharp ratio, and of course a sharp ratio, which is moving with the, with the two factors. And the optimal strategy is given by this. That's a pi stars you, you got from your, for optimizing the, the quadratic. And, but of course, since we don't know V, we don't know these derivatives and we don't know pi star. So the problem is that it's nice, it's beautiful, but uh, it's kind of difficult. Now, um, let's look at the case where you have constant coefficient. Let's make it very simple. And that's a Merton's case. And I'm, I'm saying that this is still difficult because this is a fully nonlinear AGB equation with a terminal condition, but we know a lot about this equation. And the main fact is that this equation can be linearized. And this is very important here. Each time something can be linearized, when we will do approximation, then the accuracy of approximation will be easy. When I say easy, I mean uh, with some work, but it will be easy. And I will comment on that later on. But this equation can be linearized by duality, taking the Lausanne transform of the solution and writing an equation for the Lausanne transform. And you get this heat equation, basically, your Black-Scholes equation with a terminal, a terminal, uh, a terminal condition. So, so this is nice because then in linear equation, you have a lot of uh, results on linear, linear PD, and then you can handle the V. So, so the key word is that this can be linearized and handled by linearization. Associated to that, you define the risk uh, tolerance function, like what you did for the U, for the utility function, you do it for the V at any time before, minus VX over VXX, and you observe that this risk tolerance satisfies this equation, which is of course nonlinear, but this is called the fast uh, diffusion equation. And it has a lot of nice properties, which has been studied by Thalea and uh, quarters. And uh, we did some work with uh, Raymond. We have a lot of estimates on this, on, on this, uh, on this equation. And uh, the portfolio, the optimal portfolio can be written in terms of this uh, risk uh, tolerance uh, function. This is given by this formula. And in the case of uh, utility, we have the explicit formulas that everybody know. And the risk tolerance is simply uh, proportional to X. The, the pi is proportional to X, so it's a proportion of your wells. That's well known and you have exactly what is the, So all this is well known, but the key point is linearized. Another case where you can linearize a problem and then the problem uh, stays uh, manageable is when you have only we, when you have only one factor, one factor, only one, and power utility. So if you have power utility and one factor, then the problem can be linearized. And every, uh, I told you, every time it's linear, then things are much simpler. So how do you do that? It's done by a distortion transformation, which dates back from uh, Thalea some some years ago, and uh, so you can show that the value function can be expressed as your utility times a function which depends only on t and, and y to some power q and the exact power q that you need is this so rho is a correlation between the two boolean motion a gamma is this uh, is this from one over gamma over uh, one minus gamma over gamma and then this is the exact exponent that you should put here so that when you plug this v in the agb equation the nonlinear term will cancel and then you get a linear equation for psi. So that's what we mean by linearization, it means by this distortion transformation, it's called distortion transformation, then psi is solution of a linear equation with terminal condition one, and there is a potential, and there is this extra drift here, which means that when you look at the probabilistic representation, you have an expectation of uh, we take care of the potential, but under a different measure to take care of this uh, shift here. So that is a W tilde and the E tilde. So everything is uh, very nice here, very simple. And the portfolio, the, the optimal portfolio, the optimal strategy is given by the formula we had before, 
But now we know what is psi and psi y. So we could compute that eventually. So this, the, this is a very nice, uh, very nice situation. And what we would like to do now is to uh, do some uh, perturbation, perturbation around cases where we can linearize. And the first one that I want to present is uh, correspond to a regular perturbation. And it's a work that we have done recently with Maxim. And this is posted here and submitted under revision. And uh, uh, so, so, so the idea was, let's look at power utility and two correlated, two correlated factors. So we know that this cannot be linearized. This problem cannot be linearized because when you try, you will see that Q needs to take two values and that doesn't work. So you are back to fully nonlinear equation. But the idea would be to say, if they are nearly fully correlated, in the limit where fully correlated, it's only like one factor, and we should be able to linearize the problem. And so let's look at this as a perturbation of a linear problem. So this can be achieved by saying, okay, my two factors are almost fully correlated. I have this small parameter epsilon here. And then of course, I have a little bit of leeway on rho y and rho z, but they need to be around rho, because when rho x, y, z equals one, the, the, the rho y and rho z should be the same. Okay, so, so this is a, 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 what we call a perturbation around the fully correlated case. And again, why we do that? Because in the fully correlated case, we, we, we know that we can handle a lot of things through linear equation. So for instance, in the, so this is called a regular perturbation because you can set epsilon equal zero and you get the, the limit as epsilon goes to zero. That's a regular perturbation. And the limit is given by this uh, distortion transformation that we have seen before. So let me recall it. So the, the psi zero, which is here, I call it psi zero because it, it corresponds to epsilon equals zero. So psi zero is a leading order term and its solution of this linear equation, linear equation, which is given here. Uh, I'm not repeating. So you have the, the, the potential and you have this extra, extra drift here. And uh, so if it's, uh, if the two factors are completely linear, uh, completely correlated like this, then you can assume that wy equals wz, and you get your representation, your, your feynman cast formula, again, potential, and then you have to shift the measure accordingly. And then you, you get the optimal portfolio pi zero. So again, so this is all very good because psi, psi zero is solution of a linear equation. We can solve that, maybe not explicitly, but at least it's very manageable. And you know a lot about those functions. You know that the derivative exists and all this. So that gives you the, the pi zero. Now the question is, when, when we do, what, what do we do with the correction? As epsilon goes to zero, we have the zero order term. We want to see the correction. So the idea is to say, I will expand this. So I will expand, I have my psi zero here. I expand in epsilon and I should have something of order epsilon squared uh, of the power Q. I expand and I find formally, this is very simple equation for psi one. I plug into the AJB, identify term of order zero of, the, of order epsilon. And if you're the term of order epsilon will give you an equation for psi one, which is with zero terminal condition. And it is a linear equation. It is a linear equation. It has this linear operator in front and the source term. And this source term can be computed explicitly. And it involves all the derivatives, not all, but all these derivatives of psi zero, which is a zero order term for which we know plenty of things that, uh, I mean, all these derivatives exist. We have a bound for them. And uh, so, so the, this is very nice. You have the probabilistic representation for psi one. You take this linear equation, write the probability, probabilistic representation. And actually you can see that psi zero is strictly positive. So all these derivatives which involve in F1 can be bounded and actually for epsilon small enough, you can, you, can, you can show that this is positive and that's needed of course, because you put it under the power Q. So this better be positive and that's the case. Okay, so, so here is the thing. So, but this, this is all uh, uh, informal, formal or informal. I never know if it's formal or informal. But, uh, but uh, what we want to do, what we want to do, the mathematics of it, and we want to prove rigorously that this approximation is accurate. So, and instead of writing it like this, we can, it, we can write it uh, equivalently by Taylor formula. 
we can write it equivalently like that to show that this is our approximation to V and we would like to know that the difference is of order epsilon squared scaled by X to the peak. So, so we want to prove that. Uh, and uh, until now with two factors, we don't know how to do that. Uh, so, so this is what I want to, what I want. If that's my comment about linear equation, if V was a solution of a linear equation in general, if it's a linear equation, we would simply write the difference between V and the approximation, apply the L operator. And this L operator will be, we will show that this is of order epsilon squared with a zero terminal condition, and we will be done by the maximum principle, by feynman cast formula, whatever. And this has been used a lot in the books that we wrote in 2011 with uh, George, Ronnie, and Knut, and all, all this is well, uh, is, is well known for linear equation. It doesn't mean that you have to work, but this is very simple. By just this trick, you can, you can indulge the, the accuracy of approximation. Now, the situation for nonlinear equation, of course, is much more complicated. And the way that we will uh, address that, the way that we address that will be by uh, using sub and super solution for this, uh, for this equation. So let me explain how this is working. So the first thing is that I, I summarize what I said before. For psi zero, we know everything. So we can make uh, assumption. Let's say all these are bounded. We, we can make assumption on the coefficient functions. So that psi zero and psi one are uniquely defined, bounded as well as a partial derivative up to other two. So this is assumed that we can do that. And this is, this is easy to, to derive, provided you make assumption on, on the coefficients here. So let's first consider gamma between zero and one or P between zero and one, that's uh, one minus gamma is P. And let's define uh, two function V minus and V plus like this. So this is our approximation. We want our approximation, but then I will correct in epsilon square with an M here, the M will be a constant and that constant will be uh, determined later. And it will, it, will, uh, it will help us showing that V plus is a super solution and V minus is a sub solution of the equation, provided that M is given large enough and then epsilon is chosen uh, small enough. So this is what we want to prove that this forms the right way to form sub and super solution. So, uh, so since P is positive, be careful because you have a P in front. Since P is positive, that's why we assume that. Since P is positive, we really have V minus less than V plus. And we can check right away that at the terminal time, the terminal uh, condition is exactly U of X. Because this is, this is one and this is zero and this is zero. Okay, so let's introduce the linear operator associated to the HGB equation. When you fix pi, you fix the, 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 the strategy pi and you look at this linear operator, right? So let's call that Q pi. So for, for the HGB equation, you maximize in pi. Here we don't maximize. Look at it and, and the strategy will be the following. Show that there exists an M and an epsilon bar. So epsilon is small enough. So that Q pi zero, so this is, Q, when you use pi zero of V minus is positive. And if you use V plus and you take the supremum on all the pi, then this is negative. In other words, V minus will be a sub solution and V plus will be a sub solution, right? And note that we are ne never assuming anything on V, right? And the only thing we will use from V is its definition. So how that goes, direct computation. In this case, you just go direct. Uh, you can do it by hand. You can use some uh, Mathematica help, but uh, I like doing it. I'm old fashioned, I do it by hand. And uh, so, so you take your computation, you put the V minus and you compute and this is what you obtain. So basically what is happening is that the term of order zero and of order one will disappear because of the definition of psi zero and psi one and you are left with term of epsilon squared and higher order term. But if you analyze correctly this epsilon squared term, you see what is inside here. So this is only involved in size zero and its derivative, and we, we can bound that. We, we, saw, we saw that this can be bounded. Okay, so this is bounded, and this blue term, that's a very important part, this blue term is positive. Uh, this is positive, this is Q is positive, gamma is positive because 
we have ga a small gamma less than one. So gamma, so this is positive. So that means that I can pick the M, I can pick the M so that I make this positive, right? Pick the M so that this is positive, large enough, so it dominates that. And of course, when I done that, then I can work on this and absorb, I can absorb them in, in, in this because they are order epsilon three. So I'm uh, uh, skipping a little bit of details here, but this can be, this can be done. So uh, now let's look at the super solution. Usually the sub solution is easier because you know the phi zero. For the super solution, you have to be a little bit more careful. And so you maximize on phi. So obviously this is less than when you maximize and compute and you compute. And again, what you obtain. So it's basically the same form. You have an additional term here, yeah? but this is bounded. And you have a minus M of this term. When you compute this, you get. So this is positive, you can take M large enough so this is negative and then you absorb those, those terms inside of the of this uh, uh, epsilon square term and then you get your 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 estimate that your uh, uh, super solution okay so let me uh, for those who are not familiar with that let me explain what what how this is working is this when we say sub solution actually it's a sub martingale and super martingale argument so you start with your v function by definition, this is a supremum on the, on the pi. So by, by definition, it has to be greater than when you use pi zero, right? So that's the definition of V. I'm not using any equation for V, just a definition. And so and we check that already that the terminal condition at T is the same for V minus. So you have this equality. Now you apply Ito's formula. You apply Ito's formula. And there is a martingale term. Of course, you have to check that the martingale term is a true martingale, but that's that's uh, easy to do. And then you have the sign of this, which gives you this inequality. And then that's it, subsolution. That's uh, typical of the uh, using a subsolution, uh, some martingale argument. And then the super martingale argument says you start with a pi. You start with a pi. Uh, you know that the terminal time t it's the same as v plus. We check use form take a supremum here, not here. Take a supremum on q pi. We take a supremum on q pi. It's less, of course. And then you have uh, we show this in we show an uh, inequality for that a bound for that. And so this is less than v plus. And then you have this equality. And then and then between there and there, you take a supremum in pi. Take a supremum in pi, and you get that v is less than v plus. That's your, that's your uh, uh, super solution, okay? So in conclusion, in conclusion, we, are, we, we have also obtained that pi zero is nearly optimal. Uh, we, we obtain the, the accuracy of our approximation and we obtain that pi zero, a subproduct. Pi zero, of course, this is less than that because this is a supremum, that's positive, and it is of order epsilon square, uniformly in TYZ. So that's a proof, and uh, uh, I, I hope uh, this is clear how to use a regular perturbation in this case, and uh, and uh, sub and super solution or sub martingale and super martingale. So I may may stop a minute here because I will switch to another model where we will deal with singular perturbation. So if uh, Agostino you want to arrange from uh, for some questions, then this would be a good time. Agostino. Agostino, are you here? Hello, hello. Agostino, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, I was muted and I get just got unmuted. So can you, you hear me? You're sleeping, Agostino. No, yeah, no, I, I <laughs> was up. very get, no, I was so careful <laughs> that I didn't realize that I had unmuted myself. No, I'm kidding. So I mean, if you have any question, ask uh, in the chat. I mean, I have a question, uh, Jambira, myself. Yeah. Um, you make the assumption that P is in the interval zero one. But uh, yes. I mean, in principle, you could take investors that are more risk averse than logarithmic investors. So you yes. could have a negative P. Can, and can is, there anything, yes. is there anything that goes wrong? Because I- Can, can I answer that, your question right away? Yeah. Here you go. Yes. So uh, if okay. P is negative, <laughs> if P is yeah. negative, there is subtility. Uh, the definition of V minus and V plus is a little bit different. You see the definition is not T minus T is minus T. So you have to take another definition, take into account that P is negative, so V minus is really less than V plus. Yep. And when you, when you do that computation, you observe 
that this term in blue that we had before mm -hmm. is replaced by this term in red, I which see. become positive because gamma is negative now. Yeah, I see. I see. And oh, so I everything goes in the same in the same way, except that at terminal condition you don't have zero anymore, but you have to check that you are in the right order, and this is exactly what is happening. And then in your uh, mm -hmm. you, some martingale and super martingale argument, you have exactly the inequality which goes in the right direction. I see. That's the so answer I, to your question. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely the answer. Thank you, Chandler. And there is another question by Arash. Uh, Arash, please uh, go ahead and let me unmute you. Yeah, you should be unmuted now, please. Hello. Uh, so Hi. my question is in your uh, 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 per, in, in your um, uh, perturbation, you got to achieve an order of epsilon squared. Yes. Right. So do you have epsilon around zero? Can you do two epsilon around epsilon, three epsilon around two epsilon, and like make a, a kind of universal approximate optimal strategy uh, of order epsilon? Yeah. You mean can you go higher in the order of approximation? That's what, yeah. is, it, is this your question? Yeah, of course, of course you can do that. You have to work a little bit, you have to compute, uh, but then you have to identify what is Psi two, Psi three. Uh, yes, you can do that. And what is interesting here, if you noticed, Pi zero is generating Psi zero and sun. And in general, Psi zero, if you take Psi zero plus the Pi, the pi zero plus Pi one, it would be generating psi zero, psi one, and psi two. So there is a, you, you see a difference of order in the in the strategy that you need to use and the the value function. Yes, you can do that. Of course, you need some work, but you can do it. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you, Jean Pierre. Uh, there is a question from Mikhail Skolnikov. Mikhail, uh, please go ahead. Sure. Hi, Jean-Pierre. Good to yep. see you, first of all. So I had a question about, um, you know, the scope of this method. So do we need exactly the type of perturbation that you used, or was it just an example to explain it? No, it's an example. It's an example, but of course, then the art is to find the right, uh, uh, the right sub and super solution, right? So depending on your example, you will have trouble to identify this. The, all the art is in it, and I want to show you an example where this is, this can be done in an easy, easy, easy way. Next, we will see an example where it's a little bit less easy. I see. So it's a proof of concept. Uh, yeah, it's a proof. Of, it's it's really uh, how to use sub and super solution to get the accuracy for this nonlinear equation without using the fully nonlinear AJB equation at the beginning. Thanks and, a lot. Uh, and I will show you another situation. And of course, uh, uh, so for instance, you could add the uh, consumption. You could uh, do a lot of things, uh, which I'm not doing here. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a proof of concept. And, uh, and that's a little bit uh, general in, in that, that respect. I see. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, another question from Shiva Darshan. Uh, Shiva, do you want to yeah. ask? Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I have a question. Um, could you also use the same technique to prove the case when uh, Y and Z are almost perfectly negatively correlated instead of... Yeah, of course. Yes. yes. Would there be any yes. additional technical difficulties posed no, by that? You have to, no, you have to change all the parameters and all the signs. And no, that will work exactly in the same way. All right, thank you. Yes. Great. Okay, so I think we can go ahead uh, with the okay. second part of the Good. talk. Okay. Yeah. okay, so let me let me go to something else. So now it's a joint work with uh, Raymond Wu and uh, Ronnie Siokar. So this is something we have been working for a long time on uh, general utility. So now the point is that I want to get out of power utility. I want to address general utility. Um, given the remarks that I made at the end, let's keep in mind this mixture of powers. Uh, typically mixtures of powers, and let's say one factor of stochastic volatility because, because if you have one factor in general utility, you cannot linearize a problem, right? So we, uh, this is where the problem is. Now you have to find, you, you, so the goal is to do a perturbation, 
around the Merton case, for which we know that we can linearize by duality. Okay, so the, the goal will be to do a perturbation around the linearized case. Uh, so so let's, uh, let's be a little bit more preci uh, pre uh, precise. And this will be a perturbation in the sense that this factor, this only factor, I will pick it is fast varying. Why I'm doing that? I could do two factors, one slow, one fast, but that's co complicated. This is a paper that will be uh, submitted soon, soon, which will be posted soon. But let's pick only one factor because we have already the problem. And I pick the fast one because now we are facing a singular perturbation. I cannot do epsilon equals zero in my equation as we will see in a minute. So, so I want to show you that even for singular perturbation, which corresponds to some homogenization problem, then the method of super solution, sub and super solution works as well. And I want to show you how this is done. So let's, to, to fix the idea, let's uh, say what is why, why is an ergodic process? It needs to be ergodic uh, on a domain uh, with natural boundaries. So for instance, if it's an OU, it's on uh, minus infinity plus infinity. You can take a CIR with failure condition and zero plus infinity. You need a nice ergodic process. Keep in mind the OU, for instance. And so there is a unique environment distribution that we denote by phi which is independent of epsilon. Of course, the way we scale this process, the environment distribution is independent of epsilon. That's why we put the one over of scope of epsilon here. And uh, what we assume is that we will see uh, some Poisson equation as a Poisson equation is, a, is an equation of that form. G is a source and you want to solve this equation. So the G should be centered for this equation to admit, uh, to admit a solution, this should be centered with respect to the underlying distribution. And then we will assume that the solution phi is bounded. So that means that G has to decay. G has to decay to its mean uh, relatively quickly to kill, to kill the phi, but this can be worked out. It's an assumption, we need this assumption. All the Poisson equation that we will encounter should be bounded and this solution should be bounded. And that, that this is a reasonable assumption. Okay, so let's go back to the problem. So we have, uh, the, the wells draw and one factor y, and we are interested in the value function. Uh, if I write the AJB equation, I rewrite the AJB equation. Now you see it's again a fully AJB equation, but it's fast varying. So we're in the homogenization regime, and you cannot take epsilon goes to zero. So that is the, the, the singular perturbation aspect. So we already said that Vxx is negative. We know that in advance, and you can write your fully a nonlinear equation, and this is your pi star. I will not use that. This is used only to derive heuristically the expansion. So this is what is done here. I take a V, I expand it, and you see V0 is a leading order of the V1 is the first question. I put a W here instead of a V, and I will explain why in a minute. So, so we are interested in these two, and, but this will be needed in the proof. These two will be needed in accuracy proof. That's a general fact, even in, in a linear case, when you have a singular perturbation, homogenization like this, you need to go farther in the expansion to be able to get the accuracy. So I will, uh, I will uh, explain that. So the, the form uh, derivation, the asymptotics has been done uh, some time ago now. I mean, this is 2017, but that was uh, really 2013 or 14. The, so when you identify all the terms, uh, you plug in the AGB equation. The first order term is your Merton. This is Merton, purely Merton, with a constant lambda, where lambda, is, lambda square is obtained by averaging lambda square. You take your lambda square, which depends on y, average it with respect to the, to the environment distribution, and this is how you should uh, look at your Merton. So, Introduce some uh, notion. I mean, this is a little bit heavy notation, but I will try to make it as uh, as simple as possible. So we have the risk tolerance function as usual. This is our risk tolerance function. We introduce the the uh, decay operator, which is simply the case derivative in x multiplied by r to the k. It plays the role of x to the k dxk. That's a little bit the same, but you have to multiply by r in this case. And it's easy to show that d1 v0 is the same as minus d2 v0. That's the property of the, of the R function. 
and then the the you have to expand the pi. The pi zero is simply given by lambda over sigma times r. You recognize the Merton formula, except that you have to follow the 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 process here, but you homogenize in r. That's a way that pi zero is obtained. So this is a leading order term. It's Merton, and then you go on in the expansion, and there actually you have an an equation for V1, which is linear with a source, and you can solve it explicitly in terms of derivative of V0. That's, that's where, and this is a number, that's a number which is obtained by averaging some coefficients. So this, this is well, we have done some, since some, uh, some time, and you have a Poisson equation. Remember that I talked about Poisson equation. So here we will assume that says that theta is bounded. That means that lambda squared Y goes to its mean at infinity at the boundary of the domain, because it goes uh, fast enough, actually. Now let's look at the, the, the W2 and W3. This is why I don't call them V2, because if I call them V2, this is what I would need in the second order approximation. And I would need to find this C2 of T and X, which satisfy itself an equation. For what I need, I, I don't care about this, it doesn't play a role, I can set it to zero. But again, this is not V2 which would be needed in the second order approximation. So this is W2, and by definition, I take this as a definition. And of course, at the terminal condition, it's not zero. And the W3, the same thing. W3 is solution of an equation. You can find W3 explicitly, but it has a function here, which should be on if you want the V3, if you want the order approximation, but we don't need that. And again, you have some Poisson equation. So I have my V0, V1, W2, W3. And I introduced, as before, the Q associated to the fully nonlinear uh, AJB equation. But now I fix pi, and I don't maximize in pi. And I define my sub and my candidates for sub and super solution. So now you see, I have my approximation, my candidate. I go to the three half term. I will need that using the W2 and W3 that I just derived heuristically in some sense. And here is what I need to make. Uh, so I need an epsilon term. So this is uh, for the epsilon. 2t minus t, this is because I will have a problem at the boundary. I need, to, uh, I need to do something at the boundary because those are not zero at the boundary. I will need to dominate. This is the exact function that I, I need. I could have put a function here and show you why this is a function that I need, but that would be a little bit longer but this is exactly the function that I need. So it's a function of, it's a, it's a first derivative of V0. And then I need also an epsilon to term with some function to be determined. And this is because of the homogenization process. Now you see that uh, Michel was asking, how, is this general? Yeah, well, it, it is general provided that depending on first, it's singular perturbation. So you need, you need to take care of the homogenization. So you need to go farther and you need to go farther here and you have to choose that correctly. So, uh, but the principle is the same, but the art is to choose those functions and to show that really you can, you can uh, have uh, sub and super uh, martingale. So C will be large enough again, and this will be chosen, and epsilon will be small enough, so that again, we have here you know, some martingale inequality and our super martingale inequality. Okay, so now we need to prove that. So let me go a little bit quickly because this is, this is really quite involved. So we introduce this operator L and the Q pi zero can be written, this is a notation here, the Q pi zero can be written like that. And you compute, Q pi zero is given explicitly, V minus was given explicitly, you compute. Of course, term of order zero and of, of the uh, square root of epsilon, they go away because of the definition of V zero and V one. And you have the term of order epsilon and then I order them. So let's focus on this epsilon term here. So now what you do, if you look at this equation, L Y phi F equals all of these, that's a Poisson equation. So let's choose phi so that uh, this is centered. So uh, let's choose F, sorry. So let's choose F so that this is simply the centering of this, of this quantity. So this is how you choose F and the epsilon term becomes like this. So you center this term, the center this term, center this term, so this is here, and center this term, but the centering of this is quite simple because there is no y here, and the centering is only in lambda bar. You see when you average that, you get the lambda bar right there. 
So, and then the last comment, the last comment is that all this simplifies because this L commutes with D1. So when the DT hit the minus T, you get a minus C D1 V0. And when L now commutes here, it goes here and that's zero. That's the beauty of this, uh, of this function. It commutes with this operator. So everything is simple. And then if you look at that, you want to make Z negative or positive, depending on the case. So C can be chosen large enough. The only thing you have to do is that to show that this can dominate this. And this is a lot of computation. It's a lot of computation, but this is a very nice properties of R and V0. It has nothing, what is important here, it has nothing to do with the, uh, the uh, fully nonlinear AGB equation of V. It has to do with V0, the properties of V0, and we know a lot. Uh, all these uh, bonds can be defined by putting together the work of Thalia and uh, uh, collaborators and what we did with Raymond in the last pa for uh, our papers, and this, is, this can be achieved. So once you have ach achieved that, this is a lot of work, but this, this can be done. And then you absorb the higher order term as before, and then you get, uh, and, and here you have to take care of the terminal time. At the terminal time, this is not zero, this is not zero, and you can do exactly the same thing, dominating this, so you get this uh, terminal time. Um, I started with three minutes uh, left, so let give me three minutes. So you apply the sum martingale argument. You apply the sum martingale argument, taking care of the terminal time. Now you have this with the right sign. You have, a, I want to, to look at the martingale term in this case. So you have the, the sum martingale argument, but I want to look at the martingale term because this is in the admissibility. For, for the martingale term, I need to assume that I need to, I need to have a true martingale here. And this is, this is given by this. So I want to true martingale. This is typically, typically the kind of assumption that you put when you want to do a dynamic programming principle or when you, when you assume that pi is, is, uh, is admissible because you want a martingale. That's exactly what you have. But if you compute a little bit, because pi zero is given explicitly, this amount to this, and this is the same, but lambda square, we assume it's bounded, so it doesn't play any role. So basically what we are assuming is that the integral of, this squ of the square of the first derivative here is finite along pi zero. But, but, but this is equivalent, this is equivalent for pi zero. Okay, now the super martingale argument goes exactly in the same direction, but you have to establish that. So I will skip that because it is a little bit uh, uh, involved, but you, so you need to prove that this is uh, positive or negative. I never know which direction it goes. This is super martin, it has to be negative. So, 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 so then you need to take care of the, uh, the bundle terminal condition. You need to take care of the true martin here. You need to make sure that this is negative. We know that Vxx was negative, but V plus Xs, and you need to have the, the right sign. And so this is, and then yeah, this is what you get. The, I want to come back a little bit, not in this long computation, because that's a lot of things. I want to come back to the admissibility. At the beginning, we had this for admissibility. What we will need here is this condition. This condition, and that's a very, very uh, uh, reasonable condition for pi, for this to be a martingale, but we use V0 here. And then this is the additional condition that we need for pi, along pi, we need this to be a square integral. Rule. This is not too strong. This is very reasonable assumption because if pi, pi equals pi zero, those two are the same and they are satisfied. We can check that they are satisfied. So this is the assumption that we make on pi along the pi, the wells will make this uh, square integral. Rule, and this is satisfied for pi zero. So the conclusion is that if epsilon is small enough, we have our super solution. We have the accuracy of our approximation and we have the near optimality of pi zero. Uh, and this is how it goes. Uh, so, so I know that this is a little bit technical, but uh, in the end, it's kind of satisfying that we know that uh, everything that we have said for some years is true. And uh, I hope that this technique can be uh, the guide for other situation, let's say people doing a consumption, then you can do the same thing. Uh, I'm working with uh, Yuri uh, Saporito and Sebastian Jimunga on another paper where they do 
this is kind of uh, homogenization and the same techniques uh, works quite well. Um, if you want to do second order approximation with the homogenization, you have to be very careful to get the right V2. So that's uh, some work, but it can be done. So, so there, there is a lot of places that, that work, but it has to be an optimization problem. It has to be an optimization. The AJB comes from an optimization problem. Thank you and stay healthy. Okay, thanks Jean-Pierre for like uh, this uh, wonderful uh, and super technical talk. I think uh, that's very well delivered. Uh, there are uh, like uh, some other questions. One is from Osvaldo Assunsao. Uh, and Osvaldo, if you want to go ahead and ask the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, Professor Cook. Uh, nice to hear you speak again. Is he unmuted? Yeah, yeah. I don't understand. I don't hear. Okay, yeah. okay. Cannot hear him. We cannot hear you. Okay, okay can you hear me now? Yeah, now yeah. I can hear you. Yes. Okay, yeah. sorry. So, first of all, it was a pleasure to hear you talk. One of the things I miss at UCSB. So, I have a simple question on slide 21. Uh, when you define W2 and W3, uh, you set C to be zero. I don't quite get why you can set that to be zero. Well, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So you have to go through the proof. Okay. You have to go through the proof to, to make sure that uh, this is exactly what you need from W2 and W2 to get, to get this estimate. So you get this estimate from W2 and W2 and that's all you need. So you have to go through the proof to, to realize that the C will disappear. The C will be it, it's, it's not a function of Y. It will be it by a derivative in Y, so it will disappear. The reason is that. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, thanks for um, answering the question, Jabir. So a question, general question uh, that I have is, uh, I mean, the, all the assumptions that you're making on the coefficients are those satisfied by most of the models using financial mathematics. Uh, or can you say anything well, about uh, me for if, if you want to use this? Uh, for yeah, so for, frame. For, for instance, on, on the process Y, it yeah. was either an OU or a CIR, so that's very reasonable, right? Uh, yeah. Now you have yeah. uh, assumption on the coefficients. Yeah, uh, exactly. For instance, we assume that the, we assume that uh, the sigma, the, the sigma is bounded, eventually uh, bounded, yeah. not the way from zero. But, but lambda is bounded. So for instance, lambda bounded. Yeah. Uh, that's fairly reasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. I, when lambda is greater than four, that's suspicious. Okay, so, so lambda yeah. bounded is fairly reasonable. That lambda goes to a constant as the factor goes to infinity. Uh, I'm not sure that this is reasonable or not. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's very, I mean, the, in other words, the probability that you go extremely far in the y fa in the y factor is so small that maybe that doesn't matter in practice. Yeah. The fact that you have an epsilon small that has been very well documented, and in yeah. fact you have more than one scale. You should have the sole scale at the same time, which is maybe even more important in uh, portfolio optimization. We can put the two scales together little even more technical, but we can do it. It will be in the paper. And yeah. then uh, you can resolve the small and the fast scale at the same time. So, I mean, overall, yes. And uh, some, uh, some of the assumptions can be relaxed by working out. <laughs> yeah, working out. Yes. Good. Uh, another question that I had is the process Y, that's like the factor process, uh, you assume it to be observed, right? Yes. And uh, yeah, I think financially, you, you might think uh, this process is capturing somehow the macroeconomic conditions, which may not be observed at all yes. times, or they might observe, be observed with some delay. Do you think there is any way to extend this framework, of course, in a later paper, to account for this partial observability? Well, we uh, have done some work with Andrew Papanico and Ronnie Sirka, where we do filtering. Yeah. on the Y process and that's not, I mean, we have written some papers. Another yeah. approach that we took is what we call the lazy strategy that mm -hmm. we 
um, we homogenize the lambda as well, the, yeah. the pi zero. But of course, that will be suboptimal. You are yeah. losing something. Uh, but we showed that on data that this is not too bad when you have a high volatility, a lot of volatility, uh, that uh, that it's quite good to do that actually. But uh, but yeah, this is a long discussion, and uh, yeah, here we follow we follow the Y process. And in this example, I was mentioning a paper uh, by uh, Yuri and uh, Sebastian that uh, we are working on um, on data. You see the Y. So it's another model from a uh, market friction where, where you see the why. So, yeah. So it, it depends on the situation. But here, uh, I agree. You, you have to you have to follow the why. Yep. Perfect. Thanks, Jean Pierre. And there is a follow up question by Adita Mailaswari. Uh, Adita, uh, you are unmuted. You can go ahead and ask question. Uh, hi, Professor Fook. Um, it's good How to see you again after a long time. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if um, like people in the industry um, or practitioners like use um, utility function for portfolio optimization problems in general, other than like obviously the mean variance formulation. Well, I don't know. Um, I'm not in the industry, so yeah. you should ask people mm -hmm. in the industry. Uh, I mean, utility optimization is a part of the is part of the of the mathematics, and uh, here I'm claiming that uh, this is a big revolution for the industry. I'm just claiming that this is mathematics, and uh, some things that we have uh, proposed as approximation. Now we can really prove that these approximation are mathematically correct. Uh, now, if you do mean variance. Maybe some techniques like that can be applied to mid variants. Uh, no, uh, I've not looked, so so I don't know. Uh, so I don't know. I cannot I cannot answer that question because I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Um, any other question? Okay. It seems that uh, yeah, there there are no other questions, uh, at least for this formal part of the talk. Um, okay. So in that case, I would like to, yeah, to thank Jean-Pierre again for uh, delivering a wonderful talk. I mean, this was certainly very interesting. I mean, I learned a lot from uh, techniques. I was not aware of all this. And uh, I would like to also ask everybody to still stay on uh, because there will be, as I mentioned, uh, an informal discussion coming up. And uh, I mean, this formal talk, you, in discussion, you will be able to answer questions that you didn't want to ask during the talk or like share your views and talk about anything you like about math finance and beyond. Okay, with that, I would like to, yeah, to thank Jan again and everybody for uh, attending the talk. And as usual, uh, I mean, please feel free to send us any feedback uh, and uh, comments about how the seminar series is going. If you would like uh, to make, if you would like to see something that we are not currently offering or like something that you would like to improve. We are all ears. Okay, thanks everybody. And uh, please stay on uh, for the informal part of the talk. I think we can stop recording here. <laughs>